Good afternoon, members of the audience and special guests. Uh, before we begin the proceedings on behalf of all those present, I would like to acknowledge this webinar is hosted on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I would also like to pay respects to the elders past, present and emerging, acknowledging them as the traditional custodians of knowledge for this land. This session will now be recorded. We'll record audio, screen share and our presenters. We'll not be recording any video or audio output from the audience. Welcome to all UTS, UTS st students, staff and all friends of ACRI and UTS. My name is Dr. Cory Bell, and I'm a Project and Research, Research Officer at the Australia-China Relations Institute at the University of Technology, Sydney, or UTS ACRI. UTS ACRI is an independent non-partition research institute established in 2014 by the UTS. Chinese studies centres exist in other Australian universities, but UTS ACRI is Australia's first and only research institute devoted to studying the relationship between these two countries. UTS ACRI seeks to inform Australia's engagement with China through research, analysis, and dialogue grounded in scholarly rigour. If you'd like to learn more about UTS ACRI and the Australia-China relationship, details are available on our website at australiachinarelations.org, no spaces. So today we're happy to launch this, uh, a report titled First Generation PRC Migrants and Social Cohesion, Views on News about the PRC and Chinese Australians. This was authored by UTS ACRI's Deputy Director, Professor Wan Ning Sun. This study addresses some issues that dominate Australian media coverage of China and Chinese Australians and the impact that these, this, this coverage has had on some Australian Chinese, first generation Chinese Australian, Chinese Australians or Chinese migrants. So the event will begin with opening remarks from Honorary Professor Verity Firth, a member of the Order of Australia, who is a former minister, who is a former minister for Women of New South Wales and the current Pro Vice Chancellor of UTS, driving the university's push for social justice and inclusion. This will be followed by a panel discussion featuring the author and two distinguished guests Mr. Jimmy Lay, President of the Victorian Chapter of the Chinese Community Council of Australia, and Dr. James O'Donnell, lecturer in the College of Arts and Social Sciences at the Australian National University. The panel will be moderated by Professor Monica Atta, a, re a recipient of the Medal of, Order of, the, Medal of the Order of Australia who is now the co-director of the Centre for Media Transition at the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at UTS. So to the audience, there will be an opportunity for you to submit questions. If you'd like to do so, please use the, use the QA, Q and A button on the bottom bar. So I'll now hand you over to Professor Firth. Hello everybody. And I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm at UTS as we speak. So I'm on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I want to pay particular respects to the Gadigal people as the traditional custodians of knowledge for the land upon which the university is built. One of the interesting things about equity and diversity surveys is that responses vary significantly depending on who you ask. An employer will ask, do you feel that your workplace provides an inclusive working environment for women? An overwhelming amount of men will say the environment is inclusive, while significantly lesser numbers of women will feel that way. The same phenomenon is found with questions that are asked around inclusive workplaces for people with disability and similar results too in surveys around inclusion for culturally and linguistically diverse groups. What this reveals, of course, is that experiences differ. And when you are in the majority, you can often be completely unaware of what it feels like to be in the minority. And you can be very sure of yourself and of the effectiveness of workplace policies and practices. You can pat yourself on the back about how well things are going. But until you actually ask people what they're experiencing, you know little about the truth. In 2022, the Lowy Institute asked 2,000 Australians whether media reporting of the People's Republic of China was fair. In response, 61% said that it was fair and balanced. Only 26% said it was too negative. Lowy then asked the same question of Chinese Australians. 42% of Chinese Australian respondents said reporting about China was fair and balanced, and 42% said that it was too negative. By contrast, in the previous year's poll, 57% had, such, had said such reporting was too negative. So in yet another example, the experience of, of Chinese Australians is something very different to that of the mainstream when looking at whether or not media is fair in their report and balanced in reporting. 
ACRI's new research report, which we're going to be discussing tonight, First Generation PRC Migrants and Social Cohesion, Views on News about the PRC and Chinese Australians by Professor Wanning Sun, digs deeper into the views of Chinese Australians and their attitudes to the Australian media. This report is timely in that it provides a richness of detail into how Chinese Australians feel about their portrayal in the Australian media. And it also draws a really important link between perceived bias in the Australian media and how that impacts on Chinese Australians' sense of belonging and how that in turn impacts on how we as a nation develop social cohesion. In essence, the report is similar to the surveys I've already described. Although Chinese Australians generally expressed more trust in the Australian media than in, say, for example, the PRC state media in terms of professionalism and balance, they do believe that the depiction of Chinese Australians is not fair nor balanced. Many Chinese Australians feel that they are portrayed either as in need of protection from prosecution by the Chinese government or as Chinese agents. Most of all, they feel their contribution to Australian society is minimised by the Australian press. Considering that the first Chinese settlers came to Australia during the 1850s as part of the gold rush, it is an indictment on our country that 170 years later, Chinese Australian citizens report that they are still being made to feel like second-class citizens. ACRI's report also shows that despite an increased level of interest in engaging with Australia's electoral processes as voters, 76% of survey respondents report that they feel that they rarely or never have a say in shaping public debates. When Professor Tim Sopomason was Race Discrimination Commissioner, he did a lot of work on what he termed as the bamboo ceiling for Australians of Asian heritage. In 2014, when he undertook this research, so I'm using 2014 figures, but they haven't changed too dramatically um, to today. But in 2014, when he undertook his research, close to 10% of the Australian population had Asian cultural origins or ancestry. Of the top 10 overseas birthplaces of Australians, five were countries in Asia, China, India, Vietnam, the Philippines and Malaysia. China and India now represent the two largest source countries for immigrants to Australia. Of the 4 million people who speak a language other than English at home, close to 1.3 million speak an Asian language, including more than 650,000 who speak Chinese. However, as Professor Sopomason pointed out, at that time, only 1.7% of those who sat in the federal parliament had an Asian cultural background, and I doubt that's got much better. But in 2014, only one of 17 federal department heads came from an Asian cultural background. Of the 64 deputy secretaries, only two had Asian origins. So in other words, a total of three out of 81 departmental secretaries and deputy secretaries in the public service were of Asian cultural origin. And universities have nothing to write home about either. Professor Sopomason's audit of the group of eight universities at the Vice Chancellor, Provost, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Pro Vice Chancellor levels showed that of the 49 senior executives at these ranks, there were two who were of Asian cultural background, 3%. A grand total of four had a non European cultural background. The private sector didn't fare much better compared to 9.6 of the Australian community with an Asian background. Based on a methodology using names, only 1.9% of executive managers and 4.2% of directors had Asian cultural origins. Now, whilst reaching high levels of leadership isn't the whole story when it comes to cultural belonging, it's not as simple as that. The report that we are discussing today does demonstrate the ongoing issues faced by Chinese Australians and the deep complexities within their sense of belonging to this country. Mm. The report tells us that survey participants' responses to a number of questions indicate a high level of ambivalence, uncertainty, and even conflicted feelings about towards both Australia and the PRC. On the one hand, respondents seem to remain strongly committed to making Australia home. They want to raise their kids here. They see Australia as providing greater opportunities than China. However, 46% of respondents either strongly agree or are inclined to agree that reading media stories about the China threat 
has diminished their sense of of belonging to mainstream Australian society. And most troubling is that an overwhelming majority of respondents, 91% of Chinese Australians surveyed, voiced concerns that Australia's English language media have a tendency to engage in speculation about war with China. Chinese Australians are disturbed by this primarily because they believe speculation has the potential to become a self-fulfilling prophecy. They are equally concerned about how Chinese Australians would be treated should Australia find itself at war with the PRC. Now, I'm sure I don't need to tell this audience um, that Australia has a conflicted history. We are a nation that was built on invasion and colonisation, and there's no doubt that this origin story infects our capacity as a nation to be inclusive and welcoming of cultures other than the dominant Anglo-Saxon culture. We are still at war with our history, and having not accepted the truth of the past, we continue to make it hard for others to belong. But reports such as this one and the discussion we are about to have is a big part of creating a more inclusive and welcoming culture in our country. It's reports like this that the university and my role as Pro Vice Chancellor of Social Justice and Inclusion believe is really important to demonstrate the different experiences of Chinese Australians and to give better understanding about the dynamics of modern Australia. So I want to thank everyone for being here tonight. I'm really looking forward to the discussion. I want to take, thank Professor Sun for her incredible work in this groundbreaking report. And I now hand over to Monica Attard, who's going to lead the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Verity, very, very much for that. Some very, very interesting comments. And it is a really fascinating report, quite worrying to read, quite depressing to read on, on, on in many respects. Um, but let's, let's uh, look at it now. So one in, essentially what you ask in this research, you, you, you pose three questions. How Australia's Chinese community see themselves and their community portrayed in the media? How they see the PRC portrayed in the media? And what impact they think these portrayals have on the Australian general public? And as I think Verity has hinted there, and as I have said myself, that the, the results are slightly alarming. So. Let's start with you, Wanning. Can you please give us a big picture overview of what the focus groups and the surveys and the in-depth interviews told you in response to some of those issues broadly? In other words, what were the findings? Thank, thanks, thanks, Monica, for, for, for moderating this event. Uh, can I start by thanking you? Because um, I think as a seasoned journalist, as you are, and you're probably the best person to guide us uh, through the discussion of a fairly complex issue here. And, and I'm also so glad that, that uh, James O'Donnell is here today to, uh, to lend us his expertise on social cohesion. Um, my report includes in a sort of engage quite closely with his framework um, in conceptual terms. And of course, um, this discussion will not be complete at all without the perspective of someone from the first generation migrant cohort. And uh, so I can't think of a better person than uh, Li Jieming or Jimmy Lee to represent their voice. Um, to get back to the question, Monica, uh, you know, I'm a media and academic. And so I've been paying a lot of attention to how our media covers China and the Chinese-Australian relations, because that's part of my research. But uh, so I've reached some kind of uh, views about, you know, I formed some views about this, but I've always wondered whether, uh, am I right in having this impression? Am I too critical in my assessment? Um, I think, I didn't know the answer to that. I accepted anecdotal evidence by talking to people. And I think, but knowing answers to these questions would be very important because media studies research has already told us how important media is in facilitating or jeopardizing social, social cohesion. So, and I thought, you know, uh, if, if it is true that a significant number of our society feels unhappy or even alienated from our mainstream media, then it is not good news from the point of view of promoting national interest. 
So that is what motivated to, 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 to do this research. But coming back to the key findings, if you like, uh, um, yes, I um, started with doing uh, focus groups in Melbourne, Sydney, and Ballarat. And based on that focus group discussion, I designed a questionnaire which was participated by up to 700 people. That was a quantitative large survey. And, and then having seen the data from the large survey, uh, and in order to uh, make sense of the data, some of them surprising to me, some, some of them not so surprising to me, I uh, uh, engaged in the discussion with 12 individuals as a one-on-one -on -one kind of a conversation. And so um, I guess in terms of uh, what I have found from this uh, research activities, I guess I can uh, say a few things. First, I think, you know, as Verity has already sort of uh, alluded to, that there is a high level, let me start with not so good news first. <laughs> first, you know, there's high level of sort of uh, trust for, for from this community on or our media's reporting on domestic issues, but at the same time, a low level of trust regarding the accuracy, the balance and fairness of our media's international reporting, particularly on China. So that's that's one thing. The other thing is that um, um, within this uh, cohort that I uh, studied, there is seems to be a considerable degree of unhappiness or even alienation, if you like, uh, with um, you know, with how they are represented by our in our media. Um, as for China reporting itself, they are unhappy, but they are unhappy not so much because of it's critical, not so much because it's negative, but because they are unhappy because they think that the framing of the reporting is problematic. Because um, the, they seems to have this view that um, our media seems to be quite single-minded in pursuing a, 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 a angle of reporting China. And, and that's that's not good from that point of view for two reasons. One, um, they think this is not a how I experience China. You know, <laughs> I've seen China firsthand. I've come from China. I still have contact with a lot of people. This is not this China I and I see. China is far, far more complex than that. That's mm. the first reason. The second reason is that they actually know firsthand that such reporting will lead to, and in fact has led to increased suspicion, hostility, even blatant racism towards themselves, right? So for these two reasons, they, you know, they are quite concerned. Um, you know, as one of the, uh, one of the interviewees, Henry, Henry Law, and he said something that I thought was quite a, a sort of uh, provocative, uh, not provo uh, quite interesting and uh, quite clever. He said, if it's like you throw a rock at China, but it actually it's too far to reach China and it lands on the heads of the Chinese Australians. <laughs> so I thought quite, um, that's quite- uh, That's very, very, very smart. I mean, it's, it's, it, yeah, it's, uh, it, it is interesting. I want to pick you up on that point that you just, that you just mentioned though, that, that a lot of the media coverage left um, Chinese Australians feeling as though uh, that there was an element of, of hostility in the reporting, um, which which kind of might also transfer into a feeling that that news media has a bit of an agenda when it comes to China. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that, Wanning? What what were people saying to you? What kind of agenda did they feel was at play, and that was being you know, perpetrated by, by media, by news media in particular. Where did they see that? I think um, there, there we are, in response to that question, we're looking at two things. One is the um, coverage of China per se. Oh. The other is the coverage of the Chinese Australian communities, particularly oh. the, the, the PRC communities. Um, I think there is the perceive a few problems. And um, one is the, um, what they called the, uh, you know what the experts call the securitization of new of news. That is, um, it's not necessarily the news is too negative. It's that the news about China seems to be selected, seems to be written and framed in such a way that uh, our fear of China somehow is logical because the real the threat is real. Mm. But international relations scholars have always told us there is actually a difference between perception of threat 
and the reality of the threat. Yeah. But in order for the perception of the threat to get closer to the reality of the threat, then we need to have what international scholars called, international relations scholars called the securitization actors. And inadvertently or not, uh, our media seems to play a role in this process of securitization. In other words, um, uh, the first generation migrants have been cast in a number of roles in this kind of uh, uh, problematic uh, reporting in the sense that uh, their activities are most are very often reported usually without too much evidence, but there is a lot of uh, free suggestions and associations about the connections and the links of this community with so-called, for instance, Chinese government or Chinese Communist Party. And that itself leads to mutual distrust of the community and the media. It's, you know, it, people in the community are fearful to speak to the media because they feel that too often they have been sort of cast in certain roles and their voices been taken out of the context. And the other problem is that even though they find themselves the subject of reporting, their voices are usually absent because it's the sources that this often cited are from say the security agencies, the think tanks who you know push a certain kind of a security lie and 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 they themselves feel that they don't really have much saying in, in in stating their experience and their case forward and of course and that narrow base of the use of sources the narrow number of sources that are used which create the securitization impact um it, that that is what in turn creates that kind of drums of war uh style of reporting that presumably is what you're talking about which is impacting community yes Yes. yes, indeed. Yes. yes. Okay. Um, Jimmy Lee, I'll come to you now as someone who's intimately engaged with the community, the Australian Chinese community in Victoria. Um, is there a sense in, in that community that there is one narrative which is hostile or at the very least fearful that is kind of, you know, permeating Australian news media? Okay. Uh, first, first, I will thank uh, uh, Professor Wang Yingxuan for conducting such a comprehensive, in depth, and uh, I call the clinical uh, review of uh, how the Australian English media are reporting about the Chinese Australians. Uh, regarding the, this, this general feeling, um, probably person, personally, I would, I would not use uh, house, uh, hostile, but I, I would say that uh, uh, it's uh, make us or myself feel alienated alienated or, or reporting uh, kind of uh, bias and with pre-assumption pre uh, and uh, less balanced, uh, less objective. Uh, it creates uh, fear and uh, uneasiness. I just maybe I, I take uh, two examples. One example is uh, in late 2019, there's a case about uh, allegation of a spy. Uh, his name is uh, Li Chang Wang. Uh, there's a huge uh, amount of uh, reporting about uh, this case. Um, but uh, I, when you search ABC uh, News, there, there were about eight articles related to this case. But uh, a few years later, in 2023, really earlier this year, when, when uh, Mr. Wang's case uh, application for refugee uh, asylum uh, application was refused or rejected by the uh, by tribun tribunal. There's no report. Yeah. Yeah. So the eight versus zero. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's, that's not balanced. You, you, you can report, right? But it should be more balanced. Okay. And, and and the community and the community feels that right you're saying that, that, yeah. that that's that's a message that you're getting yes hmm. yeah you you can report but it needs to be based on facts right hmm. um and another make the sensational sensational um, and uh, of course there's in other examples yeah Oh, and of course, me, you know, me, media thrives on an element of sensationalism, I suppose, in one is one way of putting it. But it has, there is always, um, uh, there are always factors which which uh, are behind the selection of news stories. And 
and that clearly is problematic in this case as well. James O'Donnell, I want to come to you at this point because you run a regular poll on social co on social cohesion uh, for the Scanlon Foundation, so you're really the go-to person when it comes to social cohesion. <laughs> Um, from what you can gather, what implications do you see from the point of view of Australia's social cohesion goals when you see some of the findings that Wanning has come up with in this report? Thanks, Monica. And, and so many implications. And, and congr congratulations to Wanning and her team on, on the study and its credible depth and richness. Um, I'm coming to you from the lands of the Noongar people. And I'm just visiting Perth at the moment on the lands of the Noongar peoples and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. And, and the study is an incredible complement to the mapping social cohesion study. So this is the, the study that I've been involved with just for the last couple of years. So this is something that's been running since 2007. It was set up by the Scanlon Foundation and Professor Andrew Marcus of, of Monash University. Andrew retired last year, so that's how I've um, come to be involved, but working with the data for many years, but only now just recently come to, to help in managing the survey, and, and, but it's an incredible resource now in, in, in tracking the attitudes of Australians uh, to issues of social cohesion, to connectedness, to migration, to all these issues. And it's always been a powerful resource to reflect on the attitudes of, of all Australians. Um, but we, we, we it involves an annual survey that's run every year, has been running every year since 2009, but we, we historically haven't had the ability to say much about specific groups in society such as China's born migrants and not to be able to de delve deeply into these really critical issues about the, the influence of an inter interaction between media and these groups. And 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 it's been trust it touched on before but but trust is, is so fundamental and critical and also belonging and that's two things that came out so clearly in this mm. report. And, and when I say trust meaning trust in other people trust in our communities, trust in government, trust in our institutions, and, and that includes trust in media, because mm. the media is such a, a critical source of information flow. It's, it's how we understand and learn about the world and the country around us, partic particularly outside our own social networks, how we find out about information about that um, others, and, and then people coming to Australia, and people who they've been living in Australia and moved to Australia over the years. And so it's from it's been picked up before, but one of the things that was really striking to me was that that almost 60% of people in wanting study believe that media reporting on China leads to, to hostility. And that, so that's directly direct detrimental to social cohesion. Um, but between 40 and 50% of people think media reporting diminishes their sense of belonging, their faith in Australian democracy, their hope for multicultural harmony. Um, we'd hope that that kind of the sense of belonging of people who have moved to Australia will, will increase in time as they build their social networks, as they build their social roots, as they come to feel a part of Australia and they come to, uh, you know, so, sort of familiarise with, familiarise themselves with our, with Australian society and culture. So it's, it's, it was disturbing to me that also that 38% that of people, almost four in 10 people in wanting study, their belonging hadn't increased over the last five years. Mm. And that, and that belonging is so critical, not just so that, as I said, trust and belonging, they're so foundational, right? Because, you know, if we don't trust people, if we don't feel a sense of place of belonging, we're not going to engage or interact in our communities. We're yeah. not going to, you know, especially make friends across social and cultural and ethnic divides. Yeah. We, we sort of hunker down a little bit in, the, in, the, in, the, in almost fear of the other. Um, and that goes for both. And, and that goes for both the, the China-born population that's key to wanting to study, but also the general population that we've been studying over time. Yeah, we're particularly good at othering in Australia, though, as we've uh, as we've discovered over many, many long years. Wanting, I want to come back to you at this point because I mean that, that, that it seems interesting to me that um, that people's sense of belonging and their trust is so intimately tied up with the way media portrays. And 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 your your, your study found that. Um, as has been mentioned before, that there is a high degree of faith in the way the Australian media operates in relation to many issues, but not this one, but not this particular issue. Uh, and, and I wonder, you know, whether you were picking up a, an expectation or a sense that um, that th there were, that there was a, a gender setting or that there was 
apart from the securitisation issue, but that there, there was an agenda setting at play um, that was particularly aimed at harming the community or at framing the China problem as something that, um, uh, you know, th that was insurmountable? That's that's really a good question, uh, Monica, but as probably uh, a media person, uh, you probably have the better answer um, um, than me. Uh, I wouldn't uh, see, I certainly see there is an agenda, but I would be very careful to, to uh, subscribe to any kind of conspiracy conspiracy theory about, you know, the, 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 wow. co the coalition of you know, some some actors or some such things. What I actually see is probably uh, the interaction or intersection of a number of uh, independent um, forces coming together to shape the public narrative. Um, uh, for instance, from the point of view of media as an institution, you know, uh, financially speaking, they've got to worry about the bottom line. They've got mm. to keep subscriptions and increasing you know, uh, audience you know, readership. And they have to worry about that. And then the how to report on China may actually have some bearing on, you know, whether they can turn a profit or not. So this is one thing. And with, with digital media and social media becoming so prevalent, uh, journalism, the quality of journalism and the way of doing journalism has also come under a lot of threat. And you, you know this better than me. And, and then on top of that, you look at other forces such as uh, geopolitical forces. You know, you've got the bigger pictures of China and the US um, being increasingly at, log, at, at their odds. And, and, and the fact that the Australia as a middle power has been kind of caught in the middle, mm -hmm. um, yet it's being forced to make a, a, a choice. And, you know, so that itself, um, you know, is one of the sources of tension that's probably not going to go away for, for a while. And on top of that, you've got the fact that the Australia is one of the uh, uh, favorite destinations for the China-born migrants. We have a large percentage of China migrants in a way that, the, for instance, the UK or European countries you don't have. So, uh, uh, so they are more kind of visible, if you like, or in your face, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, to, not to mention the fact that Australia finds itself in a position where it's kind of worried about China, but at the same time, just cannot function without Chinese economic sort of connection. So we're so dependent on China, but at the same time, we are allies with the US. So that kind of a very, very sort of a, a, a tricky situation made where make us more sensitive to that. I think this all these factors come together um, to sort of interact to shape the public discourse rather than having someone behind the scenes sort of manipulating everything. And you know, um, so that that's how I see it. Yeah, that's a, it's a very difficult one. Jimmy, is that how you see it as well? Is that what you're seeing in the communities uh, within which you, you operate? Uh, you mean uh, Chinese Australia is called in... in, yeah, in so they in, see it less as, they see, yeah, they, they see it less as a conspiracy, but they're seeing more that there's a kind of... There are multiple factors that are interacting to create a, a, a media narrative that is, that is a, you know, a negative one. Uh, yes, I think maybe it's, uh, some media organizations or some journalists, they, some, they, they have this pre-assumption that, uh, that we, are, we are closer to, to China or, uh, or China would uh, invade Australia uh, someday or imminently. Um, just look at the latter example of early this year, the Red Alert. Uh, like reporting um, yes. on the, the splash on the front page with a map uh, of, of the earth and uh, the, the uh, fighters flying from red China towards Australia. And that's really co uh, created that sense of fear uh, to us, to our uh, Chinese Australians. I was actually going to bring that up with you. So can you yeah. talk us a little bit more about what, the, about, about what the attitude was when Red Alert was published? As a series, what were people saying? Uh, it's actually quite quite shocking. Uh, you know that image because 
it's fine. I mean, academics can do research. Uh, I mean, uh, then, then the newspaper media reports uh, objectively. But uh, why they've created that image? And uh, and uh, if you link that uh, uh, this image with what politicians say, um, for example, one former prime minister said uh, 1.2 million Chinese Australians could be used by by China to influence Australia. So. Mm -hmm. So this will cause, I mean, the people, uh, other Australians think, I mean, we, we are potentially could be spies and, uh, and they will look, look at us with a, a, a sense that suspicious. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's, it's fearful cause, yeah. James, how damaging can kind of one-off pieces of journalism like that, which kind of get to the, Get to really the impact the 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 way a community feels about itself uh, and its place in in Australian society. You know what? You know how, how damaging can it be? I mean, what impact can it have? Well, it, I mean, it's diverse, and, and people are resilient, and and they can. Many people can sort of separate out um, what they're hearing on the, on the media from from you know their experiences in their everyday lives. Mm -hmm. And that was borne out in the report too, that, that, that people do feel a sense of place and belonging in Australia. But at the same time, in response to this media reporting, they feel helpless, they feel fearful. So it, it definitely has an impact. And, and it, you know, if, 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 it's, if it's a one-off, then, we, then, you know, we can improve. Like this, this doesn't need to be a permanent effect if we, if we think about what happens next and how we sort of improve relations. But it can accumulate as... as as we go on, and and it's not just for those communities, but also for the for the wider population as well. So so one of the things we track in the in the mapping social cohesion study is is whether people have negative or positive attitudes to people of different groups. And so forty percent of people in twenty twenty two, you know, across Australia said they had a negative view of people born in China. Mm. Um, now. To be fair, that that's come down a little bit. So that was that was about fifty percent during the height of COVID nineteen. Um, but that that was another event, and and so these these events are kind of a, a, can accumulate and 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 shape the attitudes of both community. You know, I wouldn't put it as a sort of these polar communities, but um, you know, it it shapes wider society and, and how people themselves view it. So so if forty percent of having people are having negative views of people born in China, then that also then translates into discrimination and so I don't have the exact figure for, for for the Chinese population but one third of people say they feel discriminated against um, who come from a non-English speaking background every year um, yeah. and it, you know that's not just the Chinese Chinese born population that faces prejudice and discrimination it's it's lots of other basically non-European groups so there's you know still deep-seated problems of racism that have to be confronted but if you look at some of those other groups that we asked about like whether people have negative views of you know people from from Sudan and um and Lebanon and and other countries they're all, all also ones that that have this had this historic negative stereotype that's been per perpetuated through media um, and, and 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 does the impact on them peak when there is something in the media that that is talking about their communities it's it's hard to measure it quantitatively, but but certainly qualitatively from from what can understand and from from just talking to people and and asking them about their experiences. We run the survey every year, and it's getting to be a, a big survey. Um, and, and we do we do pick up year to year differences. It is it is it is challenging, especially in the current climate where you've got you know war and cost of living pressures and all these other things impacting on on people's lives at the same time. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. And I just want to remind the audience that we will come to questions probably at about a quarter past six. So if you want to ask a question, you can pop it in the Q&A box. Um, but I want to come to both you, Jimmy, and you, Wanning, on this issue of whether, uh, and Jimmy in particular, are you seeing more members of the diaspora looking to alternative news, source, news sources now? In other words, moving away from Australian mainstream media because it's not the China that they, you know, that, that reflects their experience. Uh, I think yeah, to some extent, yes, uh, some members of the community would uh, start uh, looking at the alternative sources. And uh, even in Australia, you have uh, various 
uh, sources, right? the, yeah, left, the right, or middle. Um, so, so uh, and also uh, for first generations of uh, migrants, um, they have waves of migrations, right? uh, maybe from 80s, around 1989, um, there are 40,000 40, um, migrants and the mid 90s and the, they are more professional uh, skilled migrants and then after 2000 and more business migrants. So different uh, uh, waves may, may have different uh, news consumption habits. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for more recent ones that probably will look a little bit more uh, Chinese uh, language uh, news, but yeah, different. Okay. Well, well, sticking with that that issue of, of, of differences between generations, Wanning, I might come to you on this one because another interesting finding in, in your research is that first-generation migrants from the PRC are less trust, trustful than non-PRC-born Chinese Australians that Ang English, uh, as that Australian language media reporting on China is fair and balanced, which kind of indicates a generational shift, right? Is that what you picked up? Um. I think uh, it is a little bit more complex than that, Monica. Uh, what, what we see is that we've got the uh, the general Australian po cohort on this side, and mm -hmm. they've got the PRC, China Bong, first generation on this side. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the general Australian Chinese population in the middle, but if you look at actually the points of view of the first generation uh, China Bong, their view is closer to the Chinese Australians in general than to, to the other side. So in other words, there is a little bit of discrepancy, but the, on the whole, the assessment of the Australian media's um, reporting is are still quite uh, are similar. They're a little bit more critical, but similar. And I would uh, not see that as uh, uh, so much a generational kind of difference as uh, as, as Jimmy was uh, pointed out, is diversity, is complexity within the um, community. There is people who have lived here longer than people who are more recent arrivals. And there are people who are what we call ABCs, Australian born Chinese who have no experience with China whatsoever. And there are people who come from Malaysia or Singapore, and there are people from Taiwan and, and, and Hong Kong. And so you can see there's a whole spectrum of political point of views and the whole spectrums of the migration experience. Um, so, if we actually, because I, I, I am a little bit um, hesitant about talking about this in terms of generational stuff, because I think would, for instance, would this, this China born generation uh, tend um, become less critical of our media coverage as they live here a bit longer? I don't necessarily think that's the case because I think the difference between them and the other cohort of Australians Chinese is, is that they are more critical because they believe that they are, um, are more directly involved with Chinese experience. They have first-hand experience with China that they know better, you know, than the mainstream sort of uh, um, people as well as the other form of uh, Chinese communities. And also they think that uh, they're in between in terms of their media consumption. On one hand, they can access English language mainstream media so they have a, a, a set of perspective from that body of journalism. On the other hand, they can make uh, use of the Chinese language news media as uh, Jimmy just alluded to. And on top of that, if they really like, they can also look at the state Chinese media. So they can sort of, uh, 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 sort of uh, what's the word, triangulate, you know? So a lot of people increasingly, when they first came to Australia, they they knew that China, Chinese state media is a lot of propaganda. So they kind of, they, they knew that's the reality. And they came to Australia, they think this is a democracy. This is about, you know, democratic sort of a way of doing journalism. It is more professional and, 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 and objective. And indeed, this is more or less what they see in the reporting of domestic news. But however, when it comes to reporting of in, uh, other countries, especially some countries, including China, it's a different picture. So this 
started to, to question that and say, where, where is the credibility in this? Where is the democratic standard? Uh, where is the objectivity? What are the you know, code of conduct involved in, in reporting? So I think there's a certain level of questioning or even dis disillusionment crept in. Which, which is not necessarily, as, as you're saying, not necessarily generational. It is I wouldn't say, and personally, I think it's because they think they are better positioned to yeah. judge the accuracy and the level of fairness and the balance because they bring wisdom, uh, a, 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 a diverse range of perspectives, and they are able to, to, to sort of uh, judge better than anyone, than for instance, than the people who live in China, yes. because the people in China do not necessarily have different the kind of point of view that they are exposed to. So I think it's uh, I, I think it's a matter of perspective. Uh, James, can I get your take on that? What do you what what, what did you make of of of, um, of that particular finding of Wanning's? Yeah, so I do, do agree with with Wanning there. I think there is a, there is an important generational element um, for for reasons that Wanning's sort of talked about as well, but. You know the population is very diverse, and, and in Australia, in 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 twenty twenty one at the last census, um, only about only about forty percent of people who described themselves as, as Chinese ancestors had, had having Chinese ancestry were born in in China, mm -hmm. uh, and and so large populations are born in Australia, and that's going to include some children. So I think that's over four hundred thousand now. So that's going to include some children of recently arrived migrants, but then a whole diverse population as well then we have big populations as well as when you touched on from from malaysia from hong kong from taiwan um from indonesia and they've come come from, come across it at various points in time uh some of you know we have populations of uh people from that were born in, in vietnam that came over um in the 80s and and and, and so it's politically very diverse group a socially very diverse group, also economically as well. As some of the, you know, in, including the Chinese-born ones that came in the early nineties, more likely to come on humanitarian visas and have particular attitudes, especially if they were escaping after uh, Tiananmen Square. Um, but, but certainly, you know, language is a big one here. So, um, you know, of course, most China-born migrants uh, speak Mandarin Chinese or at least Cantonese. So I think Cantonese is about fifteen percent at the moment. Um, but on the on the census, at least, you know, almost fifty percent of those born in Australia that have a you know, um, say they've got Chinese ancestry, say that they, they just speak English at home, and and so of course they're going to be less able to engage in in Chinese language media as well, and 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 so the the messaging is is that comes through to us. It, well, it's, it's similar to to other Australian born pe people, right, that have to rely on the English language media. So James, I mean that that would seem to me at least to indicate that as time goes on, um, with you know with with uh, a Mandarin or Cantonese not becoming the dominant language at home, with people you know born here who who grow up kind of acculturated, that some of the kind of social cohesion problems might lessen. Is that what you're saying? Is is that a phenomenon, or is it something that that simply can be triggered by, uh, you know, one-off events where hostility is is um, encountered or felt? So it's certainly certainly tr true that there's this acculturation process, right? Especially for people born in Australia, that that they might still be have those connections to to, to China through their parents and through their grandparents, perhaps. Yep. Um, but you know, they've gone to school. They've in Australia, the language, their friends. Uh, probably, you know, perhaps mixed, increasingly mixed, um, drawing from people from different backgrounds. But, but most importantly, the, the sort of the, the media they're getting is 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 coming from English language mainstream media. And so, whether it's good or not for social cohesion really depends on the quality of that messaging, right? Um, yeah. Because, um, you know, social cohesion is not not about sort of a homogenization or, or ha having us all believe the same thing or all believing yeah. in the tri China threat hypothesis. Yeah. For example, it should be a robust democracy, and something that came through really strongly in Wanning's study was the fact that people that have moved here from China, many of them want to be in Australia. They have a home here. They have a sense of belonging, um, and it's for them. It's not even so much about defending the the, the motherland. It, it's it's partly about what's what's good for Australian democracy and yeah. by implication, Australian social cohesion. Yes, yes. And I mean, that brings me to the point. I mean, there, there presumably, though, um, even in the minds of demographers like yourself, you know, limits to social cohesion, are there not? I mean, are, are there limits to social cohesion? Should the broader Australian community, for example, simply accept that some Chinese who've come here have been 
you know, beneficiaries of the Chinese system and that for them criticising China in the way that we're seeing is offensive. There's always going to be some of those people that 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 will think that and will be offended by that. But um, as I say, and in, in, in we, as we can read in Wanning's report, that, that there, are, there are people that come to Australia, they, they like the standard of living, and that's what we hear as well. Um, you know, that, that they like life in Australia. They value those sort of freedoms and that ability to sort of provide for yourselves and your families in, in a way that they perhaps couldn't have done elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and and they, and they develop those sense of belonging, and they develop those friendship networks and those social connections, and they and they do develop a sense of belonging in place. But that's then interrupted by these media narratives and and um, you know and, and experiences of, of stereotyping and prejudice and discrimination. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, and 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 that's true. So so the and the longer that we create this conducive and harmonious environment in which people do feel welcome. Um, People, people will continue to feel that sense of belonging and identity, but you know that relies on, on us not othering. And so, so key for, that I always emphasise with social cohesion is it should never be about, as I say, the idea that we all have the same ideas or same beliefs, or and and you know we can't criticise each other or other things or other people or other countries because it might hurt other people's feelings. It, it should be a ro robust democracy in which we're free to debate and discuss and criticise. Mm -hmm. um, but in a sense in which there's 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 balance and 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 fairness and and, and th people feel that things are being reported fairly. Hmm. Monica, if I can uh, just follow up on what Please. James has said, I really want to strongly echo that. Like, I think it's important to to realize that uh, um, it's the messaging messaging itself that that's important. Of course, uh, uh, I would hate to see that. The, as as time goes by, there's more acculturation, so there's less complaint, less less unhappiness, simply because people just become less interested in critical different perspectives. You know, if if that's the case, I, I don't really think that's 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 I don't think that's social cohesion. I just think, as James said, we need to have a public domain in the public sphere that is uh, that affords a whole range of different points of view, and uh, rather than just uh, Aiming exclusively for a sort of a, you know a overriding sort of message that, that uh, hopefully more and more people will subscribe to and less and less people question it. You know. And how hopeful are you, wanting given what we've seen, particularly you know th this year with the Red Alert series, and and that particular media outlet being absolutely impervious to the criticism, the the, the enormous criticism that came its way. Um, you know, what hope do you have that the that the public discourse might at some stage uh, improve on this particular issue, if you like? Well, uh, I uh, I would like As to say that, I would like oh. to say I would like to say I'm an optimist and I, I'm hopeful, but uh, I've got to be realistic as well, yeah. uh, because I don't really think there is uh, much we can do about what our commercial media want to do, and they will continue to be worried about the bottom line, and they will continue probably continue to see. Uh, uh, China as uh, reporting as an important business strategy in, <laughs> in keeping the media uh, business afloat. So there is not much we can do about that apart from just saying we're not happy with that. But having said that, I do think that our public funded broadcasters, they are funded by the taxpayers' money and they have the responsibility to uh, play a leadership role in providing points of view that are uh, not uh, uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, just to re re reproduce or echo what's what's being said in the commercial media, but rather actually to, uh, to, to lead a, a sort of a debate by providing critical voices and the points of views. Um, that comes really uh, strongly in my conversation with people. People say, I'm a taxpayer, you know, I can. I think I should have the reason to expect our media to do better, to serve to serve us better. So, so there are a few questions here from members of the audience. We might just quickly go to them because I do see that at six twenty-five we've got a, we've only got five minutes left of this um, panel discussion. So, if I could take you there, um, uh, 
So one of the questions um, is that, thank you for the presentation from all of you. I'm also a first generation PRC immigrant. I'm not sure whether you re read the report from the Pew Research Center, which talks about Asian American views on their homelands. The report marks that remarks that Chinese Americans are less favorable to the PRC, which is an interesting one. Wondering, I wouldn't mind getting your take on that. Um, over Chinese social media, there are also comments from young people who have overseas studies, immigration experiencing argue, experiences, arguing that old overseas Chinese immigrants who immigrated to foreign countries before the 2010s are very unfriendly towards mainland Chinese. Um, so the question is, do you think this reverse racism phenomenon within the overseas Chinese communities is a result of Western mainstream media coverage? Wanting, I might come to, I think that's probably one for you. I think that we need to do further research on that to speak more meaningfully to that question. Uh, that was about the American in, uh, context, and it would be interesting to see how that that insights um, resonate with our Australian experience. But what I can say is that uh, uh, the so-called so-called Chinese community here is not a monolithic kind of a. Uh, uh, entity and there is generational differences and all other kind of difference depending on 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 what and uh, certainly sometimes even tension and conflict within the communities mm -hmm. and um, so and there is sometimes this prejudice and you know um from one cohort against another um you know but uh, that's anecdotal mm -hmm. uh, jimmy can speak probably to that question too um but i think i need to do more research to actually, you know, to speak, to say more confidently. Yeah, Jimmy, do you have a, do you, can you add anything um, there? I think it's quite di diverse. Uh, again, I mean, even, even within Chinese Australian community, uh, uh, I mean, individuals have uh, different views of other individuals. Uh, this, this, they're all normal. Um, so yeah, that's, that's all I can comment. Okay. Um, look, we have one person here, Francis Lee, who wishes to speak about bias media, but I don't think we have the capacity to actually put anybody's voice to this webinar. So, Francis, if you'd like to write your question, we'd be happy to ask it, but you'd need to do it pretty fast. Um, and there appear to be a, quite a few other co uh, comments kinds of um, questions that were being asked here. One of them relates to the so-called double-faced, double standards that the CPP also uses to criticise Western media. But let's take that as a comment for the moment. Um, and, and some references to US-driven um, Australian puppetry following um, by targeting PRC as a threat war invader with no evidence which very much has a negative impact, which is, of course, what we've been discussing here today. Um, but I think, look, at this point, we, in, in the absence of any other questions, unless somebody does have a particular question that they wish to put pretty fast, we might actually wind it up there because we've got one minute before we actually need to do that. Um, but wanting, thank you for, uh, for the research. Uh, thank you for, for publishing such a comprehensive report. It really is um, a, an extraordinary read, a very worrying read for many. Um, James, I thank you as well for being here today and good yes, luck with thank the you, James. of your index. Uh, and, and Jimmy Lee, Dr. Jimmy Lee, as it turns out, yes. thank you very, very much for being with us in this forum today. And, uh, and on that note, I think we're going to hand back to Corey Bell, if you're there, Corey. Hello, can everyone see me? Yep. Hi. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much to our eminent speakers and thank you very much to our moderator. So to members of the audience, we'll be sending an email to everyone here asking for your thoughts on how this webinar went. So if you could please fill out the feedback form, we'd really appreciate it. It will help us make the future of UTS ACRI events a better experience for everyone involved. So if you'd like to know more about the Australia-China relationship and about our research, uh, more details are available on our website at australiachinarelations.org, no spaces. So the discussion today will be also will, should also be available there. Um, please follow us on Twitter for the latest news, which is at ACRI underline UTS. Uh, thanks again to our speakers and all our, all our attendees and see you next time. Thank you.